Well, good morning, church. Um, happy Sabbath to you. Can we lose a little bit of that volume? Okay. Sorry. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's great to be here together. Um, who's got the... Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, it's a continuation of our, of our message. We had a, a bit of a break in between our message, but um, let's get straight into having a look at our, at our recap from the last time we were together. We, we started looking at the three angels' messages, and um, as we've gone through the first one, the preparation to get into the three angels' messages, we realized that God's intention is to, for this message, these three messages to, to go around the world and to prepare people for His soon coming. We, uh, we looked at that. And so uh, the first angel's message, God has a last message of warning to go out to the world. This is God's last warning message. In fact, Revelation 18 is the end. If, you are, if you're a student of the Bible and uh, you read Revelations, you start from Revelations 1, you read to, ver- to, to chapter 18 and you can see God's mercy and you can see God reaching out. Revelation 19 and it's the, it's the saints on the sea of glass. It's the saints that are worshipping um, God in heaven. Revelation 18 is a reflection of Revelation 14 about a message that is to encircle the globe, a message of warning. So we looked at that. We also looked at um, the concept of what it means to fear God. Remember we talked about that God does not want a tormenting fear but he wants a fear that's driven by love and reverence. He wants a fear that we understand who he is. We don't fear who he is out of tormenting, being, being, being um, traumatized. God wants that fear to go away. We looked at Bible verses and, and to establish that. We began to look at give glory to him, which is in the first angel's message. We understood To give glory to Him means is to praise the Lord in all of our situations. Sometimes we only praise God when we have the opportunity where something good has happened or um, you know, we we get to bring someone to church or, or so on and so forth. However, like James says, we praise God in all of our situations, knowing that our tough times are just as important, as Tanya was reflecting, as our good times. They do the work of of character development. And so thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the opening up of our our sermon time. Let's uh, let's get into our our study. So um, we're looking at, we're going to continue looking at um, glorify God for for the hour of His judgment has come. We are told to glorify God um, of His judgment. His judgment has come. For Christians, the time of God's judgment is a time of glorifying and praising God. Now, for Christians, we say that the time of God's judgment is a time of much praise and much glory. We ask, we ask ourselves the question, why is it? Because the majority of our world and maybe even some people sitting here, the final judgment is a time of fear. Am I going to measure up? Am I going to be called worthy into God's presence? I pray with the time permitted for us today that we can examine this. And by when you leave today, you will have a much clearer understanding of what the judgment and the process of the judgment is. Um, let us confirm. We'll confirm a little bit later in our sermon why it is that Christians are giving glory to God through the judgment. Let us first examine a couple of things. Have you ever asked the question when you read your scriptures, who is being judged in Revelation 14 verse 6? You know where it says, give glory to God for the hour of His judgment has come. I know that a lot of people have held the position that this is the time that God is being judged because of His plan of salvation and God's being judged by the universe, and they look at the word His as it's His judgment. Some people say that it's the judgment of the earth, and it's the judgment of humans, 
And some people say it was the judgment of the devil being judged. How, um, how does all this fit in? Well, let's allow the Bible to speak for itself and let's find out who is going through this judgment of the first angel's message. Who is going through this judgment? On, your, on the screen there, we go to John chapter 12, verse 27. Let's go in your Bibles. John chapter 12, verse 27. Now, um, I, uh, I normally put the, the verses up on the screen, and that normally helps me with time because we can go straight to it, we can read it. But it doesn't help us as we're turning our Bibles. We get a little bit complacent with uh, we finding our Bibles and reading it for ourselves. So um, we'll, just, we'll just turn in our scriptures today and we'll go to John chapter 12. And let's begin with verse 27. Once again, we're looking at who is being judged in this first angel's message of give glory to God for the hour of his judgment has come. Let's start with verse 27. The Bible reads, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Jesus talking. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sakes. Or for your sake, sorry. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. John's giving us a very clear indication of Revelations chapter 14. Who is this judgment referring to? Who is going through this time of judgment? You see, this, these Bible verses tell us that this is not the time that God is being judged for his plan of salvation. This is not the time that God is in the dock and the universe is judging God because of what he has done by enacting the plan of salvation for humanity. The Bible says this is not that time. God was judged by the universe when his son died on the cross. God's plan of salvation was judged by the universe when his son died on the cross. The plan of salvation needed to be judged. Was God right in providing a way for humanity to come back into everlasting life? Was the sacrifice of God's dear son able to save humanity? We can see when Jesus was hanging on the cross, God, the Godhead, the plan of salvation was under scrutiny by the heavens and by those who live in the heavens and we see that God was judged when Jesus sacrificed his life. What was the outcome of God's judgment on the plan of salvation? What was, God's, what was the outcome of God putting a plan together with his son, sending his son in, in our form, sending him to live 33 years and a half, what was the outcome of God's judgment? Well, let's go and have a look at that. Revelations chapter 12. Come with me to the last book of the Bible. Revelations chapter 12. Revelations chapter 12. And we're going to read verse 12. And we're going to see what was the outcome of God's judgment. We've already established that Revelations chapter 14 is not the time of God's judgment on himself for his actions. That happened when Jesus died on the cross. Let's look at the outcome and let's see what the Bible says to us about how Jesus and God went through this judgment. Revelation 12 verse 12 says, Therefore, re oh, sorry, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has... What's that last saying? The last words. A short time. Up until the cross, 
The devil had not been given an expiry date. Up until the cross, the devil was able to go into the unsearchable un, un, um, um, worlds of the universe and he was trying to plant the seed of disobedience all throughout the universe. Only until the cross was he able to do that. But the Bible says to us, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why is it that they can rejoice? Because God's plan of salvation has been judged, and it has came out that God's judgments were sure and pure. And how do we know that? Because it says, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth. The devil now has been locked away from the universe. The devil now is, is no longer able to go and roam the universe and try and plant his seed of deceptions and lies. The universe now is safe from sin germinating. However, what about you and me? It's woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And how do we know that this was the judgment of the devil? Because the Bible says to us, come back to the last part of verse 12. It says, because he knows that he has a short time left. Revelation chapter 14 is not talking about the judgment time for the devil. Because that's taken place. When Jesus died on the cross, that was it for the devil. That was it. He has an expiry date now. He received that at the cross. The universes are at peace now because there's no being going around there trying to cause um, dissension. However, there is one area or one group of people that's left to be judged. Um, there's another thing we need to look at here. What about Satan's accusations against God? Do you remember his accusations that he made against God? He said that God... God's laws were unfair. Remember those accusations? If you got the book, The Great Controversy, it's time to start turning those pages again. I think it's time we start looking through those pages and start reading them. God, God was uh, falsely accused that his laws were unfair. God was falsely accused that he was a power-hungry, a power-loving God by Satan. God was falsely accused that Satan was unfairly judged and cast out of heaven. You see, Satan received his sentence when God's dear son died on the cross. You remember when, when God's son died on the cross to save humanity from our sins? God's son died on the cross to vindicate his father from Satan's lies. And finally, God's son died on the cross to protect the unfallen worlds from Satan's lies. So Revelation 14, the judgment of Revelation 14, is not the judgment of God. It's not the judgment on the devil. It has to be the judgment of humanity. God's been judged and to be found righteous. Satan has been judged and has been found to be a liar. Let's go and have a look now at what um, our judgment time or what Revelation chapter 14 is actually referring to. Who is the judgment and where does this judgment fit in our context? Let's go to 1 Peter. We're in Revelation, just a couple of verse, a couple of chapters back. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. Now please, uh, please make sure you follow with me here. Make sure you get to let me know when you get there. If you want to say an amen or you want to just kind of, I can't see your mouth, but nod your head and um, just kind of, yeah, an amen or something, just so we know we're all together. First Peter is on the screen, First Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. The Bible reads in First Peter chapter 4 verse 17, For the time has come for judgment to begin... At the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So the Bible tells us that their time will come. 
that judgment will begin in the house of God. Just come back over to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation in the 14th chapter. And the Bible says to us in verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tongue, tribe, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. We know that Peter is talking about the exact same time frame. His judgment will come and it will begin with us, the house of God. God's judgments begin with us. And if we think about what, where these judgments start and how they begin, think about this. Some people have chosen to be Christians. Some people have chosen to, to take Jesus as their Savior, right? And to, uh, and to be a Christian. But some people lack the connection and the relationship with God. Some people hold the banner and say that I identify myself as a Christian. But if we were to look at, um, how do I say this? If we, if we were to say, you consider yourself to be a Christian. Let's search your life and let's search your home and let's search everything. And let's see if we can find enough evidence to convict you as a Christian. Imagine we were to do a little experiment today. And say, all right, guys, let's all open up our Insta Instagram account. And forgive me, I'm not up to date with this stuff. Facebook, um, what are they? TikTok. There we go. That's I don't know what that is. TikTok. Uh, all these, all these, all these little things, these social platforms we have, and say, let's put your your profile up on the screen. And let's see how we go. We're going to convince you as a, as a Christian. How many of us were full confident enough that the stuff we had going through our feed would convict us? Of a Christian or convict us of someone who's just pretending to be a Christian. You see, judgment begins in the house of God first. Some people never truly cross that line and become followers and disciples of Christ. We bear the name Christianity until we have to bear the fruit of Christianity. And sometimes that can be challenging for a lot of us when we say we're Christians and then God puts us through the judgment. And now I know we're talking about judgment and we're talking about, oh, do I measure up as a Christian? Let's hold on because when we get a little bit deeper into the sermon, there's going to be a time that we will glorify God in this judgment. He's professed that it will happen. Romans chapter 14. Let's come with me to the book of Romans chapter 14. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans chapter 14, and we'll begin with verse 10. Romans in the 14th chapter. Romans chapter 14, beginning with verse 10, the Bible reads, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God. Then, sorry, so then each of us shall give account for himself before God. Not one single human being who has ever taken a breath of life and has their right mind will escape the judgment of God. Every single person will stand before the judgment seat of God. Humanity now, the judgment of, of humanity began. Remember we've done this in our, in our introduction to the Three Angels Messages and the finishing of our 2300 um, prophecy series is that on October 22, 1844, the investigative judgment began where? On the house of God. The investigative judgment began on God's children. October 22, 1844. Over a hundred years, we're deep into the judgment, living in the judgment time. The Bible says to us here that yes, every single person will stand, as it says here, for I confess every knee will bow. There's a time that the judgment will spill over from the house of God into, the, into those who choose not to follow God. 
But right now, we are still living underneath the investigative judgment time where the Bible says to us that God is taking case by case by case. And it's not singular. It's not, okay, Obed's time. He's in the judgment. Oh, finished now. Obed's had his decision to decide. Let's move on to our vow. And vow, that's not how it works. The investigative judgment time is open for all who are living. What about those from Adam? You know, you've got, you've got um, Cain and you've got Abel. We know that Cain chose to follow a life which is of dishonesty and sin. But what about Abel? Abel chose to live for God and it cost him his life. You see, names that have, that have fallen asleep come up in the investigative judgment. And God goes through the process of the investigative judgment on those who are sleeping and on those who are living. You see, we're not told when the judgment moves from those who are sleeping to those who are living. We are told to live in the time of the investigative judgment. We know the Bible says to us that all flesh will come before the judgment seat of God. But you know what's interesting here? Only those who allow the Holy Spirit to convict and to convert them have a special place in the judgment of God. Those who allow the Holy Spirit to move on their hearts, to convict and to convert them, they find themselves in a special place in the judgment of God. Now we're going to read a verse here. The next verse we're going to read is a verse that's going to really um, challenge us, but it's also going to really inspire us. Let's go to our next verse. John chapter 5, verse 24. Come over to the book of John. John chapter 5 and verse 24. As you're turning there, very important that if we are going to be preachers of the three angels' messages, it's very important that we understand what the three angels' messages are talking about. Otherwise, we can have a message that we know nothing of and we're trying to be witnesses of. And uh, I, I think we're just going to take our time to continue to go through this Precept by precept, thought by thought, and go through the, the three angels' messages. Revelation, oh, sorry, um, John chapter 5 and, uh, and verse 24. Let's read. The Bible says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment but has passed from death into life. Now, these are very, very strong words that John is, is saying here. What John is saying here is that um, a couple of things first. Let's, let's have a look at a couple of things that John's saying here. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who, first of all, hears my words and believes in him who sent me. The Bible's saying to us here, that those who hear the words of Jesus and believes in him who sent Jesus has a special place in the judgment. A very special place. Now, let's have a look and, and, and make some points here. What does it mean to hear God's word? And what does it mean to believe in him who sent Jesus? The Bible tells us in different places that all Humanity that calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. But the Bible also says in places, not him who cries out, Lord, Lord, shall automatically be saved. The Bible tells us there's got to be a relationship that's involved here somewhere. So what does it mean to call on the name of Jesus? Well, if we start looking at this and we start comparing it to our own lives, we'll see that part of the of the understanding to call on the name of Jesus means that you have accepted the gift of God's dear son. The Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, lack of time, we don't, we don't have time to really pinpoint all these areas, but we know that God sent his son to deliver us from sin. God sent his son because we could not pay the debt that needs to be paid. God sent his son to save us. So if we call upon the name of Jesus, 
We are calling upon the gift. We are making that gift ours. What does it mean to call upon the name of Jesus? It means to make the gift of God's Son your own special person in a relationship. If you call upon the name of Jesus, you're calling upon the name of God's Son who was sent particularly just for us. It also means to allow the Holy Spirit to do its work. You see, we can call upon the name of Jesus, right, when we're in times of trouble. And often we, we do that, right? We can't pay our bills. We can't put food on the table. We've got issues with temptation. There's many a things you put there. So we call upon the name of Jesus Christ and God sends his son and, and his spirit and his spirit helps us out of that problem. But then the Holy Spirit says, well, you call upon my name. Let me do the work in you that will prepare you for everlasting life. And sometimes we say, no, I'll just call you next time I need you. No, 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 no. Don't open those doors in my life because I haven't sorted that room out yet. No, 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 no. Just help me with this problem. I'll call you for my spiritualness. I'll, sp I'll call you for my Bible-related issues. But right now, just pay my bills. Sometimes we, we call upon the name of Jesus Christ, but we don't want the commitment that comes with, we, when we call upon the name of Jesus Christ. So what it means to call upon the name of Jesus Christ is to acknowledge that that gift is your very own personal gift. And when you accept that gift, the Holy Spirit is attached to it, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, let's fix up your life here. Let's, uh, let's, let's cut some things out, let's tune some things up, and let's... Uh, Heat some things up in your life as well. When we call upon the name of Jesus Christ, we will be saved, friends. He will save us not just from our problems, but He will save us from our hereditary sins, from our cultivated sins, and dare I say it, from our cherished, darling sins that we don't want to let go of. He can save us from that. The Holy Spirit will convict us of our sins. And that's where it gets serious that we're in a fork road. Do we choose to, uh, to walk down the pathway where the Holy Spirit will transform our life to go from strength to strength and from grace to grace and from righteousness to righteousness? Or do we just use the Holy Spirit to get what we want, like we go to a vending machine or something, and we still continue navigating our own path and our own life? You see, the Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus and this is the most powerful message that we could ever, we could ever um, combine with this statement, is that the Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus just the way we are. Please remember that. Please remember just the way. The first angel's message is a message that goes out to the world just the way they are and brings them to Jesus just the way they are. If we ever think that we have to tune ourselves up and cut off some of the sins and, and become a better person to come to Jesus, you are under a lie from Satan and you will never come to Christ. You will never come. Because Jesus says, comes just the way you are. If Jesus said that, um, you know, fix your life up and then come to me, why did God sacrifice his son? If it's just the baptism we need to get to heaven, why did Jesus die on the cross? He could have just got baptized and said, follow my example, I'll catch you in heaven. <laughs> but no, Jesus says, come to me just the way you are. Baptism is just part of the journey we take. It is not the goalpost. You know what the goalpost is? The second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the goalpost. Baptism is just coming the way we are and it's one more step in our transformation. It is not the only step in our transformation. Jesus says, if you call upon my name, you'll be saved. When we call upon the name of Jesus Christ, we are asking for the blood that Jesus spelt for my sins to cover my iniquities. It's kind of like a loaded verse that, that, that John's saying in John chapter 5, verse 24, isn't it? He's saying, them who, call, who, who, them who believe on him who sent me and call upon my name shall be saved. Well, it's, you know, it's a loaded verse here. We can see 
that to call upon the name of Jesus is to ask for his blood to cover my iniquity. Have you ever, have you ever had that moment when you're deep in prayer with God and you're praying for the forgiveness of your sins and maybe God has just connected you in heaven for that moment in time and you've seen the cost of that sentence, dear Jesus, forgive me for my sin. Maybe that one moment in time, God has just connected you and heaven and God's shown you how much it costs for you to say that prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me for my sin. When you realize this, maybe, maybe we will think a little bit, a little bit longer before we jump into sin. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll pray a little bit harder. Maybe we'll identify ourselves a little bit more with Jesus. And I guess to call upon the name of Jesus, ultimately, is to share the same message that Jesus has liberated us from our chains of sin to other people that are still looking to be liberated from their chains of sin. How can we call upon the name of Jesus and take all the grace and love and protection he gives us and bundle it, bottle it, hide it underneath our arms and walk past those people that are struggling with the same sin that we've asked forgiveness for, that we've asked deliverance from. You see, to call upon the name of Jesus means that we, he, sorry, gives us a love for other people. He gives us a love for others, realizing that we are instruments in these last final hours of earth's history. We are instruments that can save other people and bring them into a committed, deep relationship with Jesus. The time of the investigative judgment regarding the house of God, which is the church, will come to an end. It started in October 22, 1844. It will come to an end, the investigative judgment. The work that the church has been commissioned to do will soon be completed. Look around the world. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching in front of a church full of masks. Yes, we're in a pandemic, but we can see moment by moment that our freedoms are being inched away moment by moment by moment. We can see more of our freedoms being taken away moment by moment. Now, I'm not here to preach against vaccines. I'm not here to preach against those, those things. God's given you all a brilliant mind. We need to use it ourselves. And we need to pray to God for deliverance and guidance. Don't look to one man. That's the, that's the first mistake. Look to God. The only man we look to is Jesus. And so, but we can see wearing a mask does not mean you've got the mark of the beast. Getting a vaccine does not mean you receive the mark of the beast. Okay? It does, because we go into lockdown does not mean we're going into lockdown with the mark of the beast. We need to educate ourselves. I got a text message um, last week and said, um, and just rest assured, it's no one from this church, but... I um, got a text message and it said, um, because I get the vaccine, am I receiving the mark of the beast? This is a true question, all right? You know what my response was? I could have just used a whole lot of theology and just said, hey, listen, you cop this now, all right? You should have been listening in church. I should, I should have said that, right? However, what I said was, the only person that will not be deceived in the last days are those that have a relationship with God and that study their Bible. The only way you will not be deceived through these times now is if we have a relationship with the one true Son, Jesus Christ, and we understand and our Bibles are active in our life. Because I tell you what, friends, we have a time of shaking that's coming so soon that if we are not grounded on the Scriptures, we will turn against Sabbath keepers. We will turn against those that we have, been, we have grown up with because we have taken for granted the time to study God's Word. We have taken for granted this time. Ellen White says to us, what we have neglected to do in the time of prosperity and peace, we will be required to do under hardship, under, under persecution, we will be required to do. God's true church is not afraid of investigative judgment. God's true church embraces the time of investigative judgment.
Because what it does is that it cleans and purifies. It's a time to glorify God. The work, of the, the work that the church has been commissioned to do will soon come to an end. The work of bringing people to the truth about God is soon running out. The truth... Um, um, The work of bringing people to the truth about God's commandments, about God's salvation plan, and about God's time of mediation for humanity is soon coming to an end. It started in October 22, 1844. What date are we in today? Whatever. I can't even see this watch. Um, 31st of July, 2021. Someone do the math for that. That's a very long time. That God has been about his work of investigative judgment upon the church. The truth about God, the truth about his commandments, the truth about his plan of salvation, the truth about Jesus, his ministry in the, in the holy of holy place in heaven needs to be shared with the world before probation closes. Once probation closes... Revelation says to us, the righteous remain righteous, the filthy remain filthy. God's got a work for his church to do. Them that are to be saved in the kingdom of God have met the conditions laid down by heaven. The investigative judgment time has investigated them and they've come out with the conclusion, yes, they meet the conditions. Come in to everlasting things. They meet the conditions. Therefore, through the investigative judgment time, God is preparing the righteous for the seal of the living God. Remember, probation closing brings about the close of our probationary time. The close of, of probation brings about the close of the investigative judgment time. So all the work of preaching, all the work of living, all the work of searching ourselves, surrendering, allowing God to represent us before the throne of God has to happen in this time and in the last couple of hours of earth's history. God has a message that needs to go around this world. And I guess we could give ourselves a little Christian tune-up. Have you ever done a Christian tune-up? Anyone ever done a Christian tune-up? It's very easy, right? This is a Christian tune-up. Ready? The Christian tune-up is this. When was the last time I have ever brought someone to Jesus? That's a Christian tune-up. If your motor's running out of tune, you're not bringing people to Jesus, but yet you're claiming to be a Christian, I think we need to tune up our Christian motors. And we need to say, Jesus, I'm out of tune. Give me a service. Give me a Christian service so I need to be about your work. If I hold your name, Jesus, you're going to hold me accountable by the third commandment. You all know, remember what the third commandment is? Do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Sometimes we just speak it, but we don't think about we actually live. We can live the, the, the third commandment. We can break it by living it. Sorry, I should say that. You know, through this time, God is preparing the righteous for the seal of God. And through this time, God is marking the graves of those that have fallen asleep. Because when Jesus returns, what does the Bible say to us in in Thessalonians? For the dead in Christ will rise first. You see, this time Jesus is going and he's, he's sealing the graves to say, my elect are sleeping here. My elect. And when that trumpet sounds, it's going to be such a sound that the earth opens up. And those who have died in Christ will be risen in Christ. What a powerful message the first angel's message is. What a powerful message. From 1844, this message has been preached. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been preaching this message for over 100 years. And now we're coming to the close. I tell you what, if this is exciting, you wait till we get to the third angel's message. We are living in the time of the third angel's message right now. We are living in the time of, this, of the fulfillment of the third angel's message. The close of the investigative judgment is at the close of probation. 
So yes, every person will stand before the judgment of God. But listen to this, ready? The followers of Jesus Christ, them that are calling upon the name of Jesus. Remember what that meant. To call upon the name of Jesus means to make yourself at one with the gift that God gave us. It's to make yourself one with Jesus. And then to call upon the blood of Jesus to cover your sins. And then to accept the Holy Spirit to do His ministry in our life. So when we call upon the name of Jesus, it's an active living call. Those who are calling on the name of Jesus, well, they've got a very special place in the judgment. This is a reason to glorify God, ready, is that they pass through the judgment because they've already stood before the judge while he was mediating for man on earth. As Jesus is mediating before the, um, before the throne of God and, our, and we come up in the judgment as those that are following and calling upon the name of Jesus, when the judgment time is closed, those people will be saved and will have the seal of the living God. That's a reason to give glory to God for the hour of His judgment has come. You see... The first angel's message is a message that goes around the world and educates people about who God is. That God has sent his son to save us. Give glory to God because he represents you before the throne of God. Give glory to him because those who call upon the name of God will be saved. And as John chapter 5 verse 24 says, will pass from death into life. will pass the judgment. We already have everlasting life. Have you considered where everlasting life comes from and when, when does it start? Everlasting life begins when you accept Jesus as your Savior. Now, my mom accepted Jesus as her Savior, right? And um, now she's sleeping in the grave. How is it that my mother has everlasting life, but she's sleeping in the grave? Because everlasting life is not a position, it's a person. And if you have Jesus, you have everlasting life. Because Jesus is the essence of life. What did the Bible say? That death could not hold him. Christ was too strong for death. Everlasting life cannot contain, or death cannot contain everlasting life. So therefore, those who have accepted Jesus, because they already have everlasting life, they pass through the judgment in Jesus' care, and Jesus represents them. Remember? He represents them in the judgment on His merits, not on our merits. So therefore, we go through the judgments on His merits. This is a reason to praise God. This is a reason to give glory to God. Why is the first angel's message calling to the world with a loud voice, give glory to God? We have the message that we need to go and give glory to our God because He represents us in the judgment. You see, the thing is, you can either have God, you can either stand before God having Jesus representing you, which is a guaranteed exemption from, ju from judgment, right? Guaranteed because he represents you on his merits. Or you can choose to self-represent before God in the judgment where you come with your own representation, which is doomed eternal death. The world needs to have that invitation. You have it. You're living it. You're using this. If you pray at night and ask for your forgiveness, you are using this gift that God has given you. But I pray that God crosses your path with someone that doesn't have this gift, with someone that hasn't activated this, someone that's not calling upon the name of Jesus Christ, someone that's scared of the judgment, because you can go and give glory to God and make the beautifulest message Beautiful in their lives as well. Revelations chapter, um, Revelations chapter four, 14, verse 7. I've gone to sleep. Revelations chapter 14 and verse 7. Let's go back to that, our, our theme of study. You know by now that we're not, we're not covering every area of the first angel's message. We just don't have time 
in our limited hiring time of this church. However, our, my job as a minister is to whet your appetite so that you have, a, have, have an appetite to go and feast with the Lord in his word. Go and feast with God. We're going into a, into a three-day lockdown. We're going into a three-day lockdown. Um, let's spend some of this time searching God's word, shall we? And making sure we measure up and making sure we, we have God as our representative. Amen. The followers, the followers of Jesus know that and understand what takes place in the time of the investigative judgment. You know what takes place? A time of deep soul searching. This time, a time of deep soul searching. A time of, sur- a time of surrendering to Jesus. A time of witnessing of who Jesus is and what he is doing for us right now. And a time of lifting high the commandments of God. A time of lifting high the commandments of God. We cannot do any of these four areas unless we have a committed relationship with Jesus. Revelation chapter 14 verse 7 says to us, The hour of his judgment has come. I've sat with someone not too long ago and I said to them, How are you going? How are you going in your walk with God? You know, we're living in the final hours of earth's history. How are you going? We're living in the judgment time. And you know what this person said to me? I'm hoping that probation closes many, 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 many years in the future. I'm not lying to you. I'm hoping many, many years and plenty of time. I mean, that's a very serious snare of Satan. Catch us all unaware. The thief comes as a the thief comes as a thief. <laughs> the thief comes as a thief in the night, right? To them who are not prepared. The Bible says to us, let's read this, ready? The Bible says to us, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. It's not something that's going to come further off in the future, and it's not something that's already come. It is we are living in the time of the investigative judgment. The time has come. Please do not push this off and think that you've got plenty of time to to make those decisions. Because when you accept Jesus, it is a progressive, gradual way of surrendering self to God. It's not a once saved, always saved. I accept Jesus today, I'm saved forever. You know what? It's a relationship. We have to surrender to God. And there has to be an active working attitude on both sides. It's not something we can push off into the, into the, the distant future. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says to us. It's not something that will still come far off in the future. It has already come. From 1844, we have been living on borrowed time. We've been living throughout the investigative judgment. The investigative judgment, friends, will come to an end. The Bible informs us how to live through these times. And the Bible, the Bible shows us how to be ready for the close of probation. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bible doesn't give us a date or an hour when probation closes, but it does inform us that we will know. Let's have a look at this last verse, Matthew chapter 24. Go over to the book of Matthew. Matthew and the 24th chapter. Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to verse 32. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 32. Now, the Bible reads to us, beginning and says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. <clears throat> when its branches have already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, Know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away 
till all these things take place. And then it goes, verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. God has never gotten it wrong. He's never gotten it wrong. He's always called it, and it's always happened the way he's called it. Go back to your Bible, read the prophecies, and you'll see what God has said, it has surely come true. There's a reminder here that God's words will certainly not pass away. Heaven will pass away. Revelation 21, behold, a new heaven and a new earth. But my words will by no means pass away. God's saying to us here, don't be a drunk person in the last days. And I'm not meaning literal, I'm meaning drunk on things, drunk on um, economy, drunk on social platforms, drunk on the world. We got to be sober. Just as the, the farmer knows, or the horticulturalist knows, that when branches get tender, summer's approaching, and they start making the preparations for a changing of the season. So too, when we see these things happening, friends, the Bible has told us, wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, diseases, and then it goes on. Our freedoms will be taken away. Laws will be changed. All these things... We are, seeing the, we are seeing the season change, friends. We are seeing the season change right in front of us. And then the Bible says, know that I am at the door. Know that I am soon to come. Please, don't push things back too far. If the Holy Spirit is working on you today, He's working on you for a reason, because He wants you to live with Him in heaven. Don't deny Him His work. He's been sent to us to prepare us. If there's things in your life that you know the Holy Spirit's been working on and he's, he's asking them for you, he's asking them from you, please give them to him. Please give them to him. It's better to walk into heaven with an eye plucked out than to spend eternity with two eyes in hell. The Bible says to us, pluck out the things, put them away from you, get rid of them out of your life. And let the Holy Spirit do the work that He is called to do. We don't have time to continue on to talk about worship Him who made the heavens and the seas. We'll do that next week. We'll continue on and look at what does worship <coughs> look like and why is there an issue around worship. And that's got to do with the first, second and third angel's message. It's all got to do with worship. And so let's ask God to add His blessing to this word. And as we continue back next week, if you don't turn up, unless we're in a lockdown, you'll need a note. God bless you. Let's move on to our final hymn.